All right, I think we're on air. So, Professor Clark, you are a professor at Bethel University. Uh, how long have you been a professor? I've been teaching, um, well, I started teaching at Bethel in 1988. I've done some other things in the meantime, but um, yeah, I've been teaching at Bethel uh, either full-time or part-time uh, since 1988. And you told me your special interest is in philosophy, specifically epistemology? Yeah, philosophy of religion is what I studied. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think that epistemology is important and, and I appreciate that. Um, so philosophy, religion generally. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That is my special interest is also philosophy. So we have a lot in common there. So let's uh, jump right in. As an atheist, I don't believe there are any arguments or evidence that indicate the existence of God. And I imagine that you do. So would you mind telling me one or a few that you find that are compelling? And then I'd like to tell you my position on those and then to hear, just to hear your response to my position. Sure. Well, I, I do think that the classical arguments for God's existence um, provide some probabilistic uh, evidence that point to the existence of a, a creator who is not the same as the physical universe. Um, and so that would include both uh, the moral argument, the argument that, which says that something like uh, an all-knowing God who has purposes for our lives uh, would be important in order for us to make sense out of morality as we all experience it. Um, I also think that there's something to the argument around uh, classically called the cosmological argument, which says that there is a, uh, a reason why the universe exists and the universe is not self-explaining. And so something that's unlike the universe, something that's uh, personal and spiritual uh, would be required to make sense out of the fact that the universe obviously exists. Uh, then I also think there's uh, some weight uh, to classically the teleological design, uh, design argument um, and that that makes um, a certain amount of sense and that it points to, again, an existence of, in this case, a, a being that has intelligence uh, because planning is, is required in order for te telos, a teleology, uh, to work, in order for an end uh, to be achieved. So I, I put some weight uh, in all of those arguments, and I'd also think that there's an accumulative effect. Um, when you have several arguments that point to the same conclusion, you know, they can reinforce each other as well. And maybe different arguments have different purposes, uh, different aspects or areas of evidence that you would be looking at would point to different um, features of uh, the being who is the cause of the universe. So. Great. So that would be the moral, the cosmological, and the teleological? Sure. All right. So from my perspective, if you <clears throat> said there was like, if we had a box and we didn't know what was in the box and you said there was a rabbit in the box and your evidence for this was that the box weighed two pounds, say, then I would come back and say, well, that two pounds could be explained by a whole bunch of different things, which means that wouldn't necessarily be evidence of a rabbit. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, so you're making an analogy here, and um, it you know it's a pretty simple analogy to say that if you have uh, some evidence uh, or you're looking at some result, some some phenomenon in the universe, and you're trying to find an explanation for that, um, you would have multiple candidates for trying to explain that phenomenon. So that seems to be the point of the analogy, right? Yes. So if yep. all the arguments, the, the moral, the cosmological, and the teleological can work equally as well for, say, theism, but also for pantheism or deism or polytheism or transtheism, et cetera, then all of those arguments would kind of like be like saying this box weighs two pounds, not necessarily evidence of a god. Well, I wouldn't actually go down that path or agree totally with that. I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that all of these work equally well for all those other uh, views. Um, that would be my contention. My position is that they would. That's what I would be arguing for. Okay. Well, you know, then I think the the strategy there would be to say, all right, if you um, if you think that they work equally well for every single one of those, um, then we would have to look at them one at a time, sort of take it apart, tease it apart, and you know, and look at each one. Um, so on your analogy, that would be like saying, here's a box. I don't know what's inside. It weighs two pounds. So therefore, uh, I think it's a rabbit. And the response would be, well, no, it's, 
it's not a rabbit <clears throat> or it may not be a rabbit. It might be a, a stone, lizard. a small stone. It could be a hundred other things. But at the same time, there would be some things that we could eliminate. For example, we know enough about feathers to say it wouldn't be a feather. Oh, uh, it could be a collection of feathers or maybe a feather that's been coated in something. But I, I would just uh, pause there. I would just go to pick one of them particularly, which would be pantheism, the idea of an alternal, all powerful nature. Instead of having to go through all of them one at a time, I'm just going to go with that one. Okay. Just part of my viewpoint. But so, sure. so the logic there makes sense that you would agree that if all of the arguments can work equally as well, that would mean they are not evidence of theism. Uh, well, no, I, I think there are other problems with pantheism. So, uh, oh no, no, I just mean just in general, the box analogy works. If the arguments did in fact work for pantheism as well as they do for theism, then these arguments would therefore not be evidence of theism. Just the logic of the argument is that. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't follow that at all, um, because I, I think what you want to do is um, is you want to look at all the arguments in conjunction with enough, with one another. So you don't just sort of. Uh, take an argument like the moral argument and then disconnect it from everything else. It's like, <clears throat> I'd say a better analogy for what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to uh, give a justification or a, a rationale or, uh, you know, give some kind of warrant for believing uh, a large scale theory or a large scale hypothesis. It's a complex thing. So, you know, to me, it would be a lot more like um, trying to compare, let's say, on mass and total, uh, you know, what's the evidence for uh, the sun-centered solar system, a heliocentric solar system versus a geocentric solar system? And, you know, you would say that as you look at all the evidence, uh, your goal here is to find out which of these two hypotheses does the best job of accounting for all or the widest ranges of evidence. Um, Absolutely. So I totally agree. My, my argument is that all the arguments individually and collectively are like saying the box weighs two pounds and can work equally as well for one or the other. Yeah. Well, I, I just don't think that that's true at all. I mean, my response to that is when you put the word equally in there, um, that's uh, you know that's where it it doesn't doesn't uh, work or I, I wouldn't agree with you. No, absolutely, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't. But just the logic of the argument, if that was the case that the arguments did work equally, that would then show they don't indicate theism. That would, if I can show that they work equally, that would then invalidate the fact that they indicate theism. Is that would you agree to that? I, I'm sorry, you you, you uh, blanked out on me for just a second there. Uh, All right froze up for just a second. So would you restate that for me, please? I'm sorry. Okay. If, if I can show that all of the arguments, uh, at least the ones you've presented so far, that can work oh. equally as well for pantheism as they do for theism collectively, would that would indicate that those arguments do not indicate theism? That is, does the logic behind that argument make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. Now, you know, the, again, the problem is the word equally there. So, um, it, it could well be. Let, let's suppose in the, I use the analogy of uh, heliocentric and geocentric solar systems. Um, and, you know, what we want to do, and scientists will debate uh, some of these kinds of questions. Now, we're not debating heliocentric solar system at this point in history, obviously. But, you know, there's, there are debates of other, other sorts, of course, that are going on between uh, scientists. And... <clears throat> Let's suppose we have five hypotheses as to what accounts for a particular phenomena that we see in the world. And let's suppose that one argument eliminates two of those hypotheses. It says uh, that these two just aren't plausible given this pretty strong range of evidence here. Well, that, that's helpful because it narrows the field as to what makes the most sense. And so if we had Let's say, let's say we have three large-scale worldviews. One is pantheism, which is the idea that the world is divine, the natural world and the world, uh, the physical universe and God are coextensive or co-equal in some way. Uh, a second one would be a naturalistic worldview, which says that the physical natural world is the only thing that exists. Um, and the third one... Drop so, so I, when I when you say when I say pantheism, what I mean is Spinoza's and Einstein's pantheism, which is just the natural, eternal, all-powerful universe. 
from what I understand, that's what pantheism is from at least one of the interpretations of what it can be. Specifically, there's another one of naturalistic pantheism, which is just the natural universe is all there is. Right. Okay. Well, uh, define it how you will. I mean, the way I would look at it is to say classically, you think, for instance, of Eastern religions as uh, pantheistic in the sense that they believe that the universe, the physical universe, and a divine spiritual reality are somehow coextensive. And a naturalism would typically say that the physical universe is the only thing that exists, but doesn't ascribe to it any kind of religious, spiritual, uh, or religious kind of significance. Um, but my point is, let's just say we had three hypotheses. One is there is a God who created the universe who's separate from the world. Secondly, there is a God who is coextensive with the world. And third, the world is all that exists, the physical universe. Well, let's suppose that an argument uh, said that um, either theism or pantheism is true, but naturalism is likely not true. Well, I find that to be helpful, and that would be part of what we'd want to look at uh, as we seek to find the best explanation for the total evidence that we see around us. So in your analogy, what you're asking me, I think, let me rephrase your question a little bit, is uh, you're asking if uh, um, an argument could prove both pantheism and theism to be true, or if it could be a pointer toward both of those, um, you know, that that might well be the case, uh, and it could still be a helpful argument because it might eliminate some other options. Absolutely. So I was just outlining the uh, standpoint, my standpoint. My standpoint is, is what I'm going to be arguing is that all of the arguments work equally as well for theism and naturalistic pantheism of Einstein and Spinoza as just the natural universe and that's it. So that's, that's my starting point. And then I wanted to go, go and start with the moral argument, for example. Uh, the moral argument can be explained by pantheism as there is an objective morality, it's just an undiscovered super law of nature. So the moral, the moral argument could indicate theism, but it could also indicate a natural pantheism. Yeah, it, this is a little confusing to me because I, I don't think that in a standard sort of way of looking at these things, naturalism and pantheism would be equated in this way. I mean, typically those are distinguished. So you're, uh, it's, it's curious to me that you're putting those together. Uh, often we think of pantheism as the worldview in which uh, you know, there is a spiritual reality, but it happens to be coextensive with the with the physical universe. Uh, whereas a, a sort of true naturalism, you might say, uh, just believes in the physical universe that everything should be reduced to physicality. Um, so I would see that there are three kind of main perspectives there in terms of the worldview that needs to be accounted for. Well, if you like, I can pull up the quotes of Einstein and Spinoza and other philosophers detailing this, uh, if that would interest you. But that is, since my understanding is pantheism is, in most cases, just the natural universe. In many cases, is one of the interpretations. Specifically, mm -hmm. naturalistic pantheism being the more philosophical kind of just the natural universe. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, we, we don't need to look at quotes, I guess. I, I would just say to you that there's a difference between uh, sort of an out-and-out -out physicalist atheism, which does not believe that there's any kind of spiritual reality, uh, that the universe is physical uh, and should be understood in a physical manner only, as opposed to, for instance, the kind of metaphysic that stands behind certain Eastern religions where uh, they don't see a God who is transcendent or separate from or over against the world, but they would see uh, the universe embedding a kind of spiritual reality. So those two are, are different from each other. Um, and I, you know, I'm well aware that Spinoza uh, would hold to this, this notion that we rightly use the word God, but that God, the spiritual reality is coextensive with the physical universe. So, um, you know, I would call that pantheism. And then atheism, I would say, uh, you know, or naturalistic atheism would be this view that there just is no spiritual reality called God. So, but maybe that doesn't matter. You're, you're trying to make a point about what should be our strategy for understanding the world? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I would disagree with your definition of pantheism, but if it's all right, would you mind using my definition for the sake of the argument? 
Okay, sure. I don't think that is a problem. Okay, so so my position is is that the pantheism can explain the morality as an objective super law of nature or something which we haven't discovered yet. So it works equally as well for theism as it does for pantheism. Yeah, yeah. I've studied quite a bit about pantheism actually, and uh, the the challenge I think is giving an account. Uh, you know, of morality from a pantheistic point of view. So um, from my perspective, you know, we have to ask the question, what, what, is, what is morality? In Eastern religions, uh, there's this embedded concept of karma. Uh, now, karma has different forms, but it's basically the idea of cause and effect. If you do a certain thing, you get punished in a certain way. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's there's a kind of right and wrong in a sense that uh, if you do certain kinds of actions, you will be rewarded. Uh, certain kinds of actions will be basically punished. So for instance, the law of uh, karma might lead to reincarnation. And uh, if you are a good person, uh, that is to say, if you do certain kinds of actions, then pleasant results will, will accrue. You'll get to be uh, reborn in a better state. Um, if your uh, actions are of, of a certain kind that are not good, um, then you'll be punished. And so you'll come back uh, in reincarnation. You'll be reincarnated as a lower form of life. Uh, so there's this kind of principle of cause and effect. I would not see that as the same as you know, morality with a sense of oughtness in it. What it's saying is that if you act in a certain way, there will be certain natural consequences that are built into the fabric of the universe. And so that's the super law of karma. Um, but that's not saying that you ought to do this. It's just saying if you do, then that's the result, which to me is, is quite different than morality. So I don't know sure. if that's helpful to you. I mean, you're, you're claiming that morality can be equally explained by pantheism and theism. And yes, I, I've studied this quite a bit, uh, and I just, I, I find that very implausible. See, ultimately, um, pantheism and many of the forms of the Eastern religions um, have this concept of yin and yang with good and evil. Uh, you look at some of the Hindu gods, for example, which are morally ambiguous, they're both good and evil. Um, and there's this concept that good and evil both need to be included in the ultimate reality. Uh, and that, I think, is fundamentally different than a belief in God, which says that God is good, God is not evil, therefore good is the primary thing, and evil is sort of a negation or a parasite or dis destruction or corruption uh, of something that's good. Um, and so that's really a very different conceptuality. Um, so I guess I'm just challenging you uh, in regard to this claim that both pantheism and theism equally explain morality. I mean, I would say I don't really think that's true. All right, great. So uh, just to clarify, whenever I say pantheism, I'm talking about naturalistic pantheism, the just natural universe, that's it. So no, so not necessarily the Eastern religions, though this could be a kind of pantheism, I'm specifically okay. talking about naturalistic pantheism. So what is it about a theistic model of morality that gives it oughtness that you don't think is in a pantheistic model? Okay, so I'm just going to click in my head. When you use the word pantheism, you're really talking about naturalism yes. or a naturalistic pantheism. Okay, so that's a little bit of an unusual strategy, but I'm just going to talk that way so that we can communicate with each other effectively here. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> what's the point of morality? Well, morality is about an oughtness uh, of our behavior. So we ought to do certain things, certain actions and certain virtues and certain motives are all, uh, are all considered to be uh, positive, praiseworthy, uh, desirable. Uh, certain other actions, certain other vices we would call them, not virtues, uh, certain other motives would be considered uh, negative. So the question is, you know, what makes one virtue uh, virtuous? What makes good good? Uh, and what makes um, evil evil? Um, 
And so I would say ultimately there, there's got to be some kind of a telos or some kind of a goal that uh, good actions are pointing to. So we think, for example, what makes uh, telling the truth a virtue uh, and what makes it a good thing? Um, and, you know, within the theistic worldview, uh, I would say that, first of all, it reflects the character of God uh, because God is a promise keeping God. And then secondly, promise keeping allows us to experience a goal or a telos or an end of human flourishing that we were designed to create to experience. Um, and so uh, for me, ethics and virtue are all about uh, those actions, those character traits and those motives, which allow us to experience the human flourishing that God created us. So it really taps into the idea of purpose, that taps into the idea that there is a rationale, a purpose, and a goal uh, for human existence. Naturalistic pantheism doesn't really have a purpose or a goal for human existence. What is just is. It comes about as a result of cause and effect, but there's no intentionality or purpose or goal. And if that's the case, then you don't have a ground for having uh, an ought principle regarding certain kinds of actions, virtues, or motives. Well, from my perspective, those are all is statements. How do you get from those to an ought? Like, even if there is, God has a purpose, why does that mean we are in any way ought to adhere to it? Well, well, if God has a purpose uh, for the universe and for human existence, uh, for instance, he wants us and he created us for the purpose of enjoying love relationships. Uh, and so that's essentially a good thing. Uh, and so those actions which, um, which promote love relationship, uh, God has built into the universe this moral principle that we ought to pursue those kinds of actions. The ground of it is the fact that God has a reason for having created us or a purpose or an end for human life. So if the universe has no end or point, then, you know, I'd, I'd much more, more in tune with someone like Jean-Paul Sartre, who would say, you know, it makes no difference whether I wake up drunk in the morning or I'm a leader of nations. I mean, there, there's no difference between those two because what is just is. So I would say that I can argue there is a, a purpose in naturalistic pantheism as the idea of the best of all possible worlds and the, uh, the goal of morality would be to move towards that. But I still want to understand where does the oughtness come from in theism? Because I don't understand how any of those things, those, those are all is statements, but I don't see how you get from those is statements to an ought. Okay, well, it, it, it comes about because God has commanded that we act in certain ways. So the law of God, which is a part of the will of God, uh, it flows out of his decision uh, to create a universe and to create that universe for a particular purpose. Uh, and so from his character, he uh, issues his will uh, and those commands flow out of the fact that God has decreed certain things. God has uh, commanded certain things and it's important for us to see that when God commands something like it's it's right to keep your promises, you know, he is not being judgmental. He's not trying to keep us from experiencing the good life. Uh, he, he is uh, seeking to um, create a pathway by which we can experience uh, the thing that we were created to experience. And so there is, a, there is an oughtness that flows out of the will of God. So you're familiar with the euthyphro dilemma, I assume. Of course. So does is the commands what makes it good, or is there some independent good outside of God? Yeah, that's a false dilemma. And actually, in what I've said, I've already responded to that false dilemma, the, an option that Plato never considered. So what the option that Plato never considered is that there is a, an ontological reality that is the standard of right and wrong. And the command of God flows out of that ontological reality. The ontological reality that we're talking about there is, is the being of God. It's the character of God. And so, um, you know, the, the problem that um, Plato <laughs> uh, pre presents to us 
is an option is a is a problem in that he gives us two options but eliminates the third option that resolves the dilemma. So I'm so, going to go between the horns of that dilemma. Okay, so could God command us to do something immoral? Well, could he? I would say I, I'm willing to say that God would not, and uh, that God could not command things that are uh, ultimately immoral. Now, you know, there's lots of things that you could see that, <clears throat> uh, you know, may seem uh, that way in the short run, and you got to be careful to define your terms properly, and you got to look at every situation. I mean, I'm, I used to play athletics uh, when I was younger, and I remember somebody getting on my case about the fact that in a basketball game, a basketball player would deceive another player by pretending to pass it to the player on the right when in fact his intention is to dribble to the left. And this person said, that's immoral. You're lying because you're misleading you know, you know your opponent. And so I, I think you have to work through those kinds of scenarios just to make sure that you're not sort of overstating your case. But ultimately, God does not um, want us doing things that are contrary to his character and therefore his will. So he could not command something immoral because of his nature. There's something about his nature that prevents him from doing that? Yeah. So does that mean his nature supersedes his commands and his commands are only an expression of his nature in some sense? I, I would, you know, I wouldn't quibble about that. Uh, I do believe that God's um, will for the world and his uh, moral commands, the ought that comes with his command is a um, is something that flows out of his nature, so that his nature is in a way more fundamental uh, than than the commands. Yeah, I wouldn't quibble about that. All right, so then I would just say pantheism, as a part of its nature, also has this moral inclination, this moral nature, and it and we are we receive it through the form of a super law of nature that permeates kind of like gravity. So either you would have pantheism has a nature of morality just like God does, and then God has commands to to give us that nature, and then pantheism has a law of nature to give us that nature. So they both have a nature and a command. Well, let me ask you this question, and this this gets right at the, <laughs> you know, what I would say is a bit of a confusion here uh, between naturalism and pantheism. Um, but if you're you're talking about a naturalistic worldview, let's unpack what that is. So, what's ultimately real on that metaphysic? Um, could you give me a little more information? What do you mean, ultimately? Yeah, yeah. It, it, so let me ask it this way then. It, you know, talking about this naturalistic worldview that you're describing, um, would you see that it is intelligent or would you say that it's not intelligent? Is it something like what we see in human intelligence by analogy? Or would you say it's very much unlike what we mean by human intelligence? Unlike, there would be no intelligence. It would just be matter and motion, particles and waves. No intelligence whatsoever. Yes. Oh, uh, well, we, we would be intelligent inside of it, but it is not fundamentally intelligent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So intelligence would have to be some kind of an emergent property based on human evolution or something. Yes. All right. So, so there's no intelligence. So that means that prior to the emergence of human beings, this natural universe that you're talking about... Um, it would have no purposes, right? Um, uh, not necessarily. Yeah, like for instance, it wouldn't. Uh, this this natural reality, we could call it, um, would not prefer, for instance, that people love versus people eating each other. There would be in this ultimate reality. There's no preference of one sort of action over another. Well, I'm saying there would be, but it would be instantiated in a law of nature, kind of like gravity that we just haven't discovered yet. Okay, so what's the ground then of this law of nature is what I'm getting at. And, you know, if you're arguing for uh, for this law of nature, um, a moral law, I think you mean, right? Not a natural yes. law like gravity, but a moral law, right? Well, I'm saying they are one and the same. We can have a moral law, which is kind of like a wave or a particle that we haven't discovered yet, that it operates in nature just like gravity does. And we, we learn about it through its interactions in our brains or some sense. And okay. my ground for this would be the nature of pantheism, just like you believe the ground for morality is the nature of God. The nature of God? 
so, so you believe the ground of morality is the nature of God and theism, and I would say my ground is the nature of pantheism. Is the nature of this ultimate reality of this natural force or whatever it is. Yes. So I'm trying to get at what that is to see if there has if there's any moral uh, character to it. And um, you know, so far I think I've heard you say just to sort of repeat what I'm hearing here. I'm hearing you say that the uh, physical universe is non-intelligent and also has no purpose, right? Doesn't prefer one sort of action over another action. So for instance, if we looked at the behavior of mammals, um, and there are some mammals uh, where the male will come and kill off the offspring that have been uh, sired by another male, like lions do this. Um, now, as human beings, we would say that's awful. Uh, that's uh, immoral if we did that with other human beings. So, um, you know, if there was a woman who had uh, an offspring by another, another man and a second man came and wanted to be the one who produced the offspring uh, through this woman, so he kills the children of this other male, we would call that immoral, right? Yes, right. But, but in the animal kingdom, uh, prior to the emergence of the human race, the universe uh, is basically doesn't care about that, right? It's, it's not good or bad. It just, it, it just is. No, I'm rejecting that. I'm saying it's not, it doesn't care in the sense that it has consciousness, but there is an objectively better action. It has a betterment rule of this law of morality. So there is a better option and a worse option due Got to it. this law. All right, so, so there is an objective moral something in your view that's right. And so certain actions that reflect that objective moral principle or that objective moral system or whatever, uh, that moral law, those actions would be obviously right. And those which go against that moral law would be wrong, you're saying? Yes. Okay. All right, so you're really a Platonist then, it sounds like. No, because Platonism says that these the Platonic forms don't actually physically exist, where I'm saying this is a physically existing law that is like a particle or a wave we haven't discovered yet. So I'm not quite a Platonist. Okay. Yeah, but you're, you're like Plato, though, because you're trying to say that there is a good that metaphysically has some kind of status, existence, uh, that is outside of or prior to, um, you know, in Plato's case, the demiurge, <laughs> or the demiurge, demiurgos, or um, that it's somehow prior to um, prior to human emergence. I would say, right? So is that yes. is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just want to make the distinction because Platonism says it's not a physical thing, whereas I'm saying it is a physical thing. So it's just. But other than that, yes, I'm very much similar to Platonists. Okay. Okay. So that's helpful. So, so what you've done is really to add, you know, a, a, another metaphysic into the sort of the set of options here that we could consider. Um, and I'm not sure what you would call it, uh, but there is an option that just says, you know, that physicality, energy, and matter are all that exist. There is no platonic form or any kind of a physical instantiation of the principle of the good. Um, it's just matter in motion, energy in motion. That's what I would call atheism or naturalism. Um, but that's a little bit of a different view than what you're describing. No, I'm, that is the viewpoint I am supporting, matter in motion. I'm just saying one of those different kinds of matter that we haven't discovered yet, because there are lots out there, is a moral super law. There's a moral particle or a moral wave out there. We just haven't discovered it yet. Got it. Okay. All right. So I, what I would say to you is that there's some people who would call themselves naturalists who would be different than you. They wouldn't agree with you that there is this moral principle out there. Right? Oh, absolutely. There's people who disagree with me on everything. So, I'm sorry. You broke up on me just a moment there. But uh, so, so, you know, I have talked to people who don't think that there is any uh, sort of platonic, physical platonic good uh, that's in the universe. They think that the universe is merely the physicality and it doesn't have this, this moral twist to it. 
So let, just go with me for a second. Let's suppose we have three views to work with here. One view says you've got matter in motion, but no physical moral law. A second is a matter in motion, uh, and you do have this physical moral law. And a third is a sort of a classical view that God is distinct from the world and that the world is his creation. So if those are three options, then what I would say is that the moral, the moral principle or the moral argument uh, eliminates the first of those two. So it, it takes us from three options and sort of brings us down to two options, which is helpful. Uh, it's moving us forward. And, um, you know, I think what it would say is that uh, this option that some people hold to, and you apparently don't, so that's good for you, I think. Um, but this view that there is simply matter in motion and there is no moral principle built into that matter in motion, that that option is, is, um, is argued against based on the moral argument. Well, so that's, no, I, that's where we're at. Oh, no, I'm arguing that morality is a particle in motion. It is a particle or a wave. So I'm still holding to the naturalistic viewpoint, just particles and particles and waves, and that's it. I'm just saying morality is one of those particles and waves. It's just one we haven't discovered yet. Sure, sure. I, well, I love your creativity, and it, it's it's good. I would just say to you that there are many atheists who wouldn't agree with you on that. Oh, and absolutely. I totally, I totally re realize that. This is a hypothetical I'm saying that I can, in a naturalist worldview, explain objective morality just like theism can. No, I don't actually believe in this. I'm just saying anybody can make up a basis of objective morality and claim it's just in, tied in intrinsically to the nature of their metaphysics. Yeah, that's, that's the point I'm arguing. Yeah, so I, I think you could, so in that way, you're sort of arguing like Plato would be that there's this source of good that is prior to God. And uh, I don't disagree with you on that. I think that that, you know, that that uh, is a possibility. Um, okay, fantastic. So, um, then I would like to move on to the cosmological argument, I believe was your next one. Or did you want to say something else? Well, no, I, I think... I think that's fine. However you'd like to structure the conversation is fine. I'm just saying uh, that as we look at epistemology, uh, you know, what we want to do is to ask the question, here's a, here's a coherent worldview that makes sense out of the world as we experience it. Uh, and how does, um, you know, how does our understanding of the world um, uh, do the best job of accounting for all the different kinds of things that we see in our world? Um, so, you know, it doesn't, nothing hinges on any one argument. What we're really looking for is a cumulative case here that does the, the best job on, on the whole uh, of accounting for all the kinds of things that we see in our universe. Absolutely. And I'm arguing that the cumulative case works equally as well for pantheism. And that. we'll just, but we can only talk about one argument at a time because. Okay. So, so the cosmological argument, uh, that which begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause. This cause could be theism, but I see no reason to think it couldn't be pantheism as well. Just a, a more fundamental, eternal something that, that natural things that we just haven't discovered yet. Why would it eliminate that as an option? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a challenge, uh, and you know, I, I enjoyed talking with you here, and I'm I'm doing my best to. Um, to stay on track based on sort of some idiosyncratic uses of the term. So let's go back again and define what you mean by, uh, by this. So I'm, I'm looking at uh, the cosmological argument as an argument which says essentially that the physical universe is not self-generating. Self um, and I think there's good reason to think that uh, the universe or something like the universe couldn't be self-generating. So you're arguing that there's another kind of a worldview that could be self-generating or something? I'm saying that it is eternal. Just I'm saying the naturalist pantheism can be eternal or outside of space-time in the same way that you believe God to be. But I want to just get a little more detail. When you refer to the cosmological argument, you're referring to like uh, Craig's Kalam, I assume. So it's something like, uh, all space and time began to exist, therefore whatever created has to be outside of space and time or something like that? Well, the cosmological argument is actually a class of arguments. So it's not one argument. It's a type of argument uh, that refers to, and what, they what these arguments have in common, so those members of the class have in common, is this idea that 
uh, a physical universe uh, isn't self-explaining. So uh, the physical universe would not account for itself. So, um, you know, what are the features of the physical universe that um, render it non-plausible as a self-generating or self-sustaining or a, a self-sufficient uh, metaphysical reality? Uh, one thing that people have pointed to is the idea that the universe has began at a particular point in time. Um, and uh, that's not the only way to do a cosmological argument, but that's certainly one, one way to do it. Um, but fundamentally, what I would say is that physical systems, the universe would be a physical system, that physical systems decay. The physical system that we know in our universe is winding down. It's like a clock that's been wound up and it's winding down. That winding down process is finite. So therefore, the universe can't be infinite in terms of its time. And so something uh, must exist that is the source or the cause uh, or the ground of the universe, something that's not like the physical universe. Now, some people say, well, why couldn't you just have another universe that's the cause of this universe? And the challenge with that is, I think, that it leads to an infinite regress, which is part of the cosmological argument, uh, that if uh, you know the, the supposed ground or source or cause of this universe is another universe just like this one, then it just raises the question again, how did that universe come to be? And then, you know, you're off on an infinite regress. So that right. means I would say that the universe's cause or ground has to be something fundamentally unlike what we call the physical universe. Um, and it could be a variety of things, but, you know, God would be one of those things uh, that could be uh, perceived as the source of our universe because God is stated to be not a physical system that will wind down over time like the physical system that we're part of. Okay, so my, my response to that would be, why can't we just say there is some undiscovered natural law that can be eternal that doesn't wind down? Because the winding down, I believe, would be the second law of thermodynamics, only applies to closed systems. So if there isn't a closed system or some part of nature which isn't a closed system, then it doesn't face that problem at all. So we can say that there are natural things that don't need to wind down. And I also wanted to say that, as far as I know, the Big Bang does not indicate the beginning of all space and all time. It only indicates the beginning of our known kind of space and our known kind of time as represented in the equations of general and special relativity. So there could be other kinds of space and time that prior to the Big Bang. So, so why can't we have a undiscovered natural thing that doesn't wind down, that is not a closed system? And that would be they just go. Yeah, well, you know, this is a kind of, isn't it possible that kind of argument? And, I, and I, I agree that you could almost always say, well, isn't it possible that there's this undiscovered something out there that we don't know anything about that's actually the answer to our problem? And I would say that's always theoretically possible. And also, I'm not terribly impressed with, uh, you know, the epistemic weight of, arg arg of uh, you know, positing things that we know nothing about uh, that had not been discovered, that leave no traces of evidence that are just, isn't it possible that something like that is out there? And of course, if you say, isn't it possible, you have to answer, it's always possible logically. Uh, but to me, that doesn't say that that's the most plausible uh, of the alternatives. Um, it always seems like a sort of desperate last, last grasp at the straw uh, to, to argue for that kind of a you know, isn't it possible that sort of an argument? So I totally agree. Well, actually, what I'm doing is I'm taking the theist arguments and just reflecting them back. So I'm doing exactly what I believe theists are doing and say, well, what if it's possible if there's a God? And I'm just saying, well, what if it's possible if there's a universe? I don't see any difference between these two. They just seem to yeah, be. I, I, okay, you froze up on me for just a second there, but um, I think maybe I got your point. Um, I guess I would just challenge that, that that that's the same. I think that they're that they're quite different because there are other lines of evidence that when we put them together, uh, you know, create begin to create a picture of you know of what this being would be like. Um, so it's not exactly parallel to say that Christians are just saying, well, maybe it's possible that there's this unknown thing we don't know what it is. We'll just label it God. Now I think we're saying a lot more than that because. Uh, there are other sources of evidence that we, you know, bring into the conversation in a in a in a cumulative kind of way.
Absolutely. So, so far we've gone through the moral and the cosmological, and I think I've shown that it could be explained by both pantheism and theism, both of those arguments. What argument would you say would not indicate pantheism as well as theism? Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> uh, well, yeah, my, my thought here is that... Um, you know, we're, we're not asking what's possible. We're asking, um, you know, what seems more likely based on evidence that we have. Um, we've all been in situations where we can argue, isn't it possible? So, you know, the fact that we can reach a conclusion that both naturalism uh, and theism uh, can, um, that both of them, um, can at some level and in some way account for the phenomena that we see around us. You know, that's not sort of a knockdown, uh, drag out, end of the conclusion, end of the conversation kind of an observation. There's still a weighing of, you know, which is more likely. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, so, so, you know, that would count against an argument that says, I have mathematical proof of God. And if I say God is absolutely demonstrable and mathematically provable in that sense, and then a corollary of that claim would be, and the alternatives are therefore impossible, well, then your response to me would be to say, oh, no, it is possible, and here's how. And so, you know, that would work. But I don't think, you know, a lot of theists that I know and Christians that I know are not are not claiming that kind of mathematical certitude or kind of logical impregnability. So just the mere possibility that there are these other options out here, you know, doesn't weigh heavily against these arguments in my mind. Absolutely. I totally agree. Again, my position is that they are equal in every respect and that you can't provide a single example where they would not be equal in every respect. Probabilistically, uh, I, I agree. It's not, we can't prove one way or the other. So I am speaking probabilistically here. But right. I'm saying the probability is equally weighed on both sides for all the arguments. Well, you know, so in order to do that, that means you have a pretty clear idea of exactly how probable these two arguments are. Uh, you know, was it 67% probable or 29% probable? I mean, I, I don't think we're going to get that precise uh, to be able to say that they're absolutely equal. So it's, that's my perspective on this. I mean, to me, it seems, uh, you know, that... Um, Lots of things are possible, uh, but to be able to prove that they're all equally probable um, would require quite a lot on your part, I think. Well, actually, I'm just asking you to provide me one thing that tips it one way or the other. Just give me an argument or something that can't be explained or is explained better by theism. Because if you can't do that, and I can explain every single argument you provide for theism that to also indicate pantheism, that seems to support my position. Hold my yeah. proof. Even if I don't know what the presents are, I can still say everything that works for your position also works for this position equally as well, like the box example. Saying mm -hmm. the box weighs two pounds doesn't indicate a rabbit any more than a lizard. So, so I'm asking for you, is there any example that can tilt the scales one way or the other, and what would it be? Because as far yep. as I know, there are none, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, these are personal judgments, and so, you know, you're, you're making a personal judgment about this. Um, and, um, you know, from my perspective... I do think uh, that both of the two arguments that we have talked about uh, are much more plausibly explained by the existence of a being who is personal, therefore intelligent, or something like what we mean by human intelligence, uh, and that this being is distinct from the universe, non -a not a physical, uh, physical uh, reality. Um, and the reason for that is that if the supposed law of nature or whatever unknown thing you're, you're, um, you're pointing to is a physical being or is a physical reality, uh, then, you know, we would have to ascribe to it or it is reasonable to ascribe to it all the qualities that we know about other physical beings and other physical realities. So uh, if you say to this, you know, that there is this super law, super something that we don't know about yet uh, that could account for the universe, but it's just, it's a, it's a physical reality of some sort. Well, 
then by analogy, it makes sense for us to apply to it the other qualities that we know of physical realities. And that would include things like it cannot be eternal. Uh, it, it is a matter in motion system of some sort that is going to uh, decay over time. Uh, and so in the end, it doesn't explain uh, how things came to be. Um, so that, that to me is a, is a reason why I think, you know, I'm going to push back a little bit about your, your claim that these two are equally plausible. Well, I don't think they're equally plausible or equally probable. I think one is more probable than the other. Uh, and the reason I believe in a being who is the cause of the universe who is not physical is because anytime you posit something physical and ascribe to it the things that we know about physical things, then it doesn't work as a, as a cause of the universe. All right, so let me respond to that. Let's say, why would asserting new supernatural properties be more reasonable than asserting new undiscovered natural properties? I'm, you know what, you froze up on me there and I'm really sorry. So would you start that again? Absolutely. So why would, you said that uh, we can't, like, why would asserting new supernatural properties to things to make them like eternal thing be more reasonable than asserting new natural properties that can also make them eternal? I'm really sorry, you froze again. So I'm not sure what's going on here and I just didn't catch the key part of your sentence. Okay, so, so you're trying to make a comparison here. So help me again. Why would it be more reasonable to assert new supernatural properties than to assert new undiscovered natural properties? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, you're, you're undiscovered natural properties. So this is goes back to a, well, isn't it possible that there are these features? And the question then becomes, yes, but do you have any kind of evidence anywhere for a physical, a physical object that has the kinds of qualities that we're talking about. And, you know, from my perspective, we're looking for the positive clues that we can find that will point us in a, in a right direction. And uh, if, if the recourse is to, well, there are these undiscovered and we don't know about any of them yet and there's really no evidence for it, you know, I think we need to take that seriously. There's no evidence for it. And there's no reason to think that it, it exists, except for the fact that it gets you off the hook from this argument. So that, that to me is, is a suspicious move. I um, agree, but I think it's the same move that you're making in regards to the supernatural. It seems to me like you're, you're appealing to this thing we have no evidence for and saying, well, there's this new kind of thing that we can assert. But I can say the same thing about naturalism and just say we have this undiscovered new natural thing that we can also assert. Okay, I see what you're saying. And I don't quite agree with that. So, so I think where, where I would go with that would be to say, we do have some evidence. Uh, we have evidence that this physical universe exists. That's evidence. Uh, and we have evidence that, um, it, you know, maybe, maybe we go with Kant and we just believe that the principle of causality is sort of baked into our brains. Uh, or uh, we can go with the idea that as we look at the scientific, scientifically at the world around us, and even children do this in a non-scientific but sort of natural way, you know, we do believe that there's cause and effect. And so it's fair to ask, uh, you know, what's the cause of the phenomena we see around us? I mean, we do this all the time, right? We, we drive down the street and we see a big hole in the fence on the side of the road, uh, and tire tracks leading up to that hole in the fence. And we say to us, I wonder what caused that? Was that, you know, an accident? Was the person hurt? What happened? How did it happen? Was it slippery? Uh, was the person drunk? You know, we, we rightly ask these causal kinds of questions. So, so when we ask those kinds of causal questions, I think we're, we're pointing to evidence. And when we say that there's a universe, we're pointing to evidence. And we're saying that evidence suggests a source of a certain kind. Um, and so we, we ask ourselves, you know, what could that be? Could it be another physical reality? Well, if it is, then the evidence that we have points to us saying a physical reality wouldn't have the right features to make this happen. So it has to be some sort of non-physical being. And that lines up with, you know, what, what we believe as Christians that God has said about himself, uh, as he speaks to us, as, for instance, uh, through the Bible and through through Jesus Christ. So I, I'm just going to push back a little bit and say that, you know, these are exactly parallel because I think in my case, I am pointing to evidence. Is it conclusive? No, uh, but it's not just hypothesizing. 
You know, it's, it's looking at the world and asking us, what are the pointers pointing to? What sort of thing are those pointers pointing to? Well, it seems to me like you're ruling out undiscovered natural things and just saying we can only appeal to natural things that fit exactly the kinds of natural things we know about. I don't. That's a fair question. Right. So I think what I would say at this point is it's always possible that in the future we will discover things that we know absolutely nothing about at this point. That's always a fair thing. Um, and, you know, science moves forward and human knowledge moves forward by discovering things that we never even knew existed in the past. So absolutely, I agree with the, the possibility. So all these arguments have to deal with based on what we know now, but the evidence that we have before us at, the, at this time. And I would never rule out the possibility of gathering more evidence in the future. But what I'm just pointing out is that the kind of response you're suggesting feels to me uh, and this is a personal judgment. It just feels to me like you're, you're, you're uh, grasping at something that is sheer possibility, uh, not possibility that's maybe pointed to by some of the facts or evidence that we see in the world around us. Absolutely. And that's, that's how I feel about uh, your appeal to the supernatural. I'm trying to understand what the difference would be in this case. So how would, why would it be more reasonable to assert the supernatural than to assert an undiscovered natural thing that can do the same thing. What's right. the difference between those two? Okay, so that's a, that's a fair question. So this kind of goes back to the cosmological argument of why would you posit something supernatural? It's because anytime we look at a physical natural object and we say this is a physical ad, uh, natural object like our physical universe, then it makes sense for us to say if that's what we're going to call it, then we should, should ascribe to it the kinds of qualities that we observe in the physical world around us. And when we do that, then that object does not perform the function of causing a universe like we ask it to. And so it has to be something unlike the physical universe that we're looking at, because the physical universe won't do it. We know that. So it's got to be something different than that. So, so again, I don't see any difference here. It seems like we don't have any evidence of this new undiscovered natural thing, but we also have no evidence of this supernatural thing. The okay. supernatural thing. So, so one good way to argue one good way to build a case for something, so this is just how you, how you would structure an argument to try to understand the world, would be say we have two possibilities. Here's a possibility, here's a possibility. Now, uh, of course, what goes wrong in that is if there's a third possibility that you overlook. But let's just assume that you've clearly indicated that there are two possibilities. And the way to do that is to say that these two possibilities are either are A and not A, okay? So, we think that the universe had a beginning. Now, it may or may not have been the Big Bang. We don't know, but we, we don't believe it's eternal. And that's because physical systems uh, wind down and are not self-regenerating. We don't have any examples of physical systems that are self-regenerating. So the physical universe had a beginning. So then that, posit, that causes us to posit that there must be some sort of something that is the source of this physical universe. So... Let's do an A, not A. That other source is either fundamentally like this universe or it's fundamentally different than this universe. Now, if it's fundamentally like this universe, all the evidence that we know about the actual universe we're in would be ascribed to that universe or that cause as well. And we know that won't work because that cause needs an explanation. So therefore, we rightly posit that it has to be something fundamentally different than the physical universe that we are currently living in. And that means that those metaphysical systems, and let's say we had 10 examples of different metaphysical physical systems that we'd all carefully defined out. And let's suppose that five of them, you know, posit that there is this fundamental reality that's not like the physical universe we live in. And the other five posit that whatever is out there as the original source is very much like the physical universe. Well, this argument would eliminate that second group of five, and it would leave open the option for the first group of five. And that's how we would argue for or reason toward um, a particular conclusion. So to me, it's it's not as it's not totally equal between those two as as you've suggested. To me, it's definitely tilts toward the view that the source of the universe is fundamentally unlike the physical universe that we live in, because everything we know about this physical universe would tell us that it wouldn't do the job of creating another universe. Well, I would. Um, disagree with that. I think that there is no evidence to think the universe couldn't be eternal, but that is a separate issue. So, so just go to back. So let's, let's think of an analogy. 
let's say we see we have a jar of marbles and we're taking marbles out of the jar and they're all green marbles and we look into the jar and we see that there's this a green sheet of paint and the marbles are coming through the green sheet of paint and we can't see anything behind the green sheet of paint you 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 the, the, the marbles could still be green behind the green sheet of paint right we can't just assume they're not green you can't just make up a, a red color and say, oh, they're red before they hit the green sheet. We have no idea what's before the green sheet. We just see them okay. coming through it, right? Okay. So, so the same thing applies to the universe. All of the natural stuff we know of may not be eternal. I'll just grant that for the sake of argument. But that doesn't mean you can rule. You can say all possible natural things that ever exist throughout all eternity that we don't know about are also not eternal. That just seems to be an unsupported assumption. And, and we have zero evidence of the supernatural as far as I can tell. And so we have zero evidence of an unknown natural thing that's eternal and zero evidence of a supernatural thing that's eternal. And it seems like you're just using induction to say, well, all the natural things we know of aren't eternal, therefore we can apply this same property to all the natural things throughout all time and space, no matter what. And I think, I well, don't think that's- Well, so my reason. argument there is that we can apply those qualities uh, rightly to the other natural objects. At the out from that is, but isn't it possible that there is some uh, you know, some eternal physical uh, something that's out there that we know nothing of that doesn't have these properties. And I've already acknowledged that that's possible. But again, I think that that's an implausible way to argue because there's no positive evidence for it. But on the side of, you know, belief in God, I think there there is uh, this sense of a positive uh, evidence for, and it depends on, you know, some, some people are going to have a too narrow view of evidence uh, and so they may not uh, appreciate uh, all that. But from my perspective, you know, as the Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts and uh, we have this experience of uh, having a sense of dependence on a creator, it is by far a majority experience in the human race that there is a creator. Um, and that kind of direct experience of God you know, in my mind, would count as a legitimate form of evidence. Now, it's not by itself conclusive, um, but fundamentally, we have to uh, we have to allow for uh, and even affirm and account for uh, you know the fact that when we see um, uh, when we see certain objects, our eyes are appropriately uh, seeing those things, and the beliefs that form in our mind have been accurately formed. Uh, because our eyes have, you know, have seen them. And so this kind of direct experience of the world, to me, is a kind of evidence. So I would say, for instance, that I think, you know, my mother exists. And the reason I believe she exists is because I've experienced her. I've had a direct encounter with her. Now, you haven't. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't expect you to, to take that necessarily as evidence. Uh, so you don't know my mom. She lives actually in Florida. Uh, but I do, and I've experienced her, and that kind of direct encounter with this other person, you know, counts as a legitimate form of, uh, of evidence. It's not a logical, absolute one plus one makes two uh, mathematical deduction kind of evidence, uh, but then there are very few things, you know, in our world that provide that level of, of evidence. So, you know, just to push back a little bit on this idea that there's absolutely no evidence for for God. I mean, I think, you know, many, many people in the world would say, no, I, I do have uh, an experience uh, that directly puts me in touch with God. And I think that lines up well with the idea uh, that there is morality in our world and that that morality flows out of the purposes that this God has for our human experience. Uh, sometimes I fail to live up to those purposes, um, but <clears throat> you know those purposes exist because God uh, wants them to and has chosen them and has purposed them and has created me in order to experience them. Uh, you know, so all that kind of lines up. Uh, and so I would push back against the idea that, uh, of well, uh, there's absolutely no uh, evidence at all. I think there actually is some, not absolutely conclusive, but there is some evidence um, there that points toward the existence of a being who wants us to flourish and wants us to love each other and wants us to, to keep our promises uh, and wants us to experience human flourishing. So. Okay, so I wanted to ask you, you're familiar with the problem of induction, yes? Mm -hmm. So 
just if we have lots of examples of white geese, you can't then for conclude all geese are white. That would be unreasonable. You can only conclude we only have reason to believe in white geese, but there could always be more other colors of geese, right? You know, I'm sorry, you broke up just a little bit there. So if we have lots of examples of white geese, we can't conclude all geese are white. Right. Not with uh, mathematical conclusion, conclusiveness, yeah. So which means we can't also conclude that all natural things must necessarily be contingent for the same reason. There could always be more there. That's true. And so if we it's had examples... a probabilistic example, argument, yeah. So if we had examples of lots of supernatural things, and they were all also contingent and uh, diffused out in time, would it also be reasonable to conclude that God must also be contingent because he's supernatural and these things are supernatural? And they all fizzle out. Hmm. Well, I, I don't know about that. I'd have to think about that last inference there. <clears throat> I, I don't think that follows. Um, but let's look at that a little bit more in, in detail there. What's your point? Uh, that, I, I guess I didn't quite catch your point, I'm sorry. Okay, so if we have lots of examples of supernatural things, if we actually found some supernatural things and they were all uh, contingent or non-internal things, could we therefore conclude all supernatural things are non-internal, therefore God is not eternal? I see. I would push against that by saying that part and parcel, a very important part of the belief in God is that you're not going to find other examples of a su supernatural being like God. That God is necessarily, um, there's only one of them. So you're not going to find others uh, and um, you're not going to be able to say, well, here are seven infinite eternal gods and they, what I know about the one must also ascribe to the other. By definition, you can only have one infinite being, I would say. So can't I say the same thing about an unknown natural property, that there's only one eternal unknown natural property, and looking at the other eternal, or the non-eternal natural properties that won't tell us anything about that? So we have the same argument works both ways, doesn't it? Well, no, I, you know, I think that when you, when you look at the results of the actions of a personal, personal being, we do naturally make inferences about the character or the, quality, the qualities of that being uh, based on the actions that they perform. So I'm not sure if this is helpful, but um, you know, we're not at a total loss for what uh, something is like because we look at the kind of results they leave behind, um, the kind of results of the actions that they perform. So. Um, so, so if we have no inductive evidence of a supernatural thing, or we have lots of inductive evidence of a natural thing, but we have no inductive evidence of an unknown natural thing, it seems equally plausible to assert an unknown eternal natural thing as it is to assert a uh, supernatural eternal thing. I don't see any difference here. And it seems like you're just applying the natural, we know of these kinds of natural things, therefore any natural thing must also have these properties, therefore we can just eliminate unknown natural things as a plausible alternative. But it seems we have equally as little evidence for a supernatural thing, just based off this argument, it feels to me like maybe we're going in a circle on this argument here because I think I think you've asked that that once before. So the way I would see it <clears throat> is to say that when we're asking the question about what is the cause of the universe, uh, which is kind of the point of the cosmological argument, um, you know, you're back to an A or not A. Is it is it the kind of thing that uh, is physical, and if that is the case, then the evidence suggests that it will not be eternal and so self-sustaining because we we know that physical beings are not that way. So it's so that argument gets us to the conclusion that it's a non-physical something. Now it's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the you know the biblical triune God or anything like that, <clears throat> but it is telling us, I think, that the universe, the source of the universe, the ground and cause of the universe. Um, is uh, more like uh, a spiritual being um, that does not have the kinds of limitations that every physical being we know about has. Yeah, that's a really interesting argument. I'm trying to understand it a little bit more because from the perspective of like Occam's razor, it seems more reasonable to just assert that there is an eternal natural thing and add this new eternal property to known natural things than it is to assert this entirely new class of things that also has the property of eternal on it seems simpler just to say, well, there could just be eternal natural things. 
And yeah. it seems like you're, it's like a composition division fallacy of saying all the natural things we know about are not eternal. Therefore, nothing natural could ever be eternal or probabilistically isn't eternal. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's, that's a good point. I'm making an, a reference to, to Occam. You know, Occam would say that all other things being equal, the simpler is to be preferred to the more complex. But I wouldn't concede that all other things are being e are, are equal here. So, I mean, if you argued that there was some sort of a being that is non-physical and doesn't have the kind of limitations that every physical object in the universe that we know about possesses, it doesn't have those qualities, but is something non-physical, then I think that's about as far as that argument can carry us. And all right, then I'll, I'd like to respond with a different way. There is nothing in nature that shows natural things can't be eternal. We know of we, everything we know of is like the law of conservation of energy. All energy we know of is in fact eternal. We don't have any reason to think it's not. How would you respond to that argument? Well, uh, I, I mean, I think the law of entropy does push against that claim, if, unless I'm misunderstanding you. But um, you know, well, yeah. So I would, I would object you're, to the. You're, you're, it sounds like you're arguing for a kind of perpetual motion or something that it, you know that here you got a physical universe that doesn't in any way sort of decay over time, kinetic energy gets used up. Uh, and unless you have an external source of new energy added to the system, um, you know, it is going to get used up. That's what we know about physical systems. My understanding of physics is it doesn't actually get used up at all. It just gets dispersed. It's still there. It's always still eternally there. It never okay, but goes away. Used, and I, the energy doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. But my understanding is that the usable energy, energy that can be tapped to accomplish work, uh, you know, the kinetic energy is used up. That's that's my point. So, right, I'm not saying that we're destroying energy, but by dispersing it, that means that we don't any longer have the ability to uh, to tap into it or to harness it to accomplish work. Um, and so, therefore, a, phys a, a system, a physical system, always tends towards decay. Um, and and that's then I that's why the universe can't be self self-explaining uh, and therefore you need to posit something that is unlike that in order to account for uh, the physical universe that we see. So then I would object to that by saying the second law of thermodynamics only applies to closed systems and therefore if the universe isn't a closed system it can be eternally sustained. Well if the universe is not a closed system then what you're saying is you're positing something outside the universe right? Uh, just a more eternal substance being there. It's not necessarily, it still be a part of the universe. Well, if it's, if you're saying that the universe is not a closed system, then there's something outside that is not part of the universe that is, as it were, adding energy to the universe, something like that, a platonic form or something. Oh, it's like the, the known universe versus the cosmos. Uh, so in the known universe would be not a closed system. So everything we know about would there could be more stuff like virtual particles have no problem of coming into it out of existence without any usable energy they just do it automatically due to quantum right, right. yeah I'm, I'm not limiting this just to that which has been you know uh photographed by the hubble telescope i'm just saying everything that's part of physicality the the whole the natural universe um you know, if you're positing that this is not a closed system, then that suggests that there's something more than this physical universe. And that's really what I'd be arguing for. I'm saying, yeah, there is this spiritual being who is distinct from the physical universe and outside the physical universe. And therefore, the physical universe is not a closed system. To my mind, you know, as a, as a naturalist or natural, what do you call it, a naturalistic pantheist in, in your language, uh, you know, if you argue that the universe is open and that there's something outside the universe and that that is able to affect or impact uh, the universe, well, then I think that, you know, you've made a step toward, uh, toward a theistic perspective, which would be fine with me. So I would argue from something like Stephen Hawking's uh, version, he has an extra dimension of time, so our, all, ver all of our versions of known space-time could be contingent in a closed system, but there could be an additional kind of time, which is the open system. And it doesn't, it's not affected by the second law of thermodynamics. It's just yeah. eternal, has no, it doesn't fizzle out at all. There's also theories of the multiverse, or the many worlds hypothesis, or the cyclic universe, 
Um, I mean, lots of things are possible. So isn't it possible that are, there are all these things out there that we don't have any evidence for? And yes, I acknowledge that that's true. But again, I'm not impressed by arguments that that sort of jump toward that, well, isn't it possible that this or that or the other thing? So I'll tell you what, it's been a great conversation and we've been chatting for 75 minutes. Um, do we want to kind of sum this up and uh, maybe wrap up here? Sure, absolutely. Um, thanks for coming in and talk with me. I really enjoyed it. I'd love to talk with you again sometime. Uh, I'll try and think of how to better explain that eternal natural thing. Great. I'm sorry, you just froze up for a second there, but uh, I was uh, I enjoyed our our conversation as well, um, and so hope it was uh, helpful. And uh, I hope that um, you know that you're uh, we'll be able to have a conversation on another occasion. That makes sense to me. Thanks. I'll, I'd love to talk with you again sometime. See you later. Thanks. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.